Good afternoon. Hello. My name is Hello, my name is Delphine Salas Alvarez and I'm the film programmer at FIAF, the French Institute Alliance Francaise. I'm thrilled to welcome you this afternoon for a discussion with director Jeanne Balibar on her new film, Merveille à Montfermé, Wonders in the Suburbs. Thank you so much, Jeanne, for being here. I'm so pleased to have you back at FIAF uh, in this virtual space. It's a bit of strange setup, but I'm so happy to see you and thank you for being here. Uh, while we are waiting for everyone to log in and be part of this discussion, uh, please take a moment to let us know where you're coming from. We're going to have a little uh, survey pop up on your screen if you could fill it out. Thank you so much. Uh, Wonder in the Suburbs is currently streaming on Kino Marquis as part of FIAF's annual summer series, Burning Bright, New French Filmmakers. Uh, because of COVID-19, uh, our popular film series has moved on online. And I want to thank you, thanks Unifrance, the French Cultural Services, and Kino Lorber for their support. To watch Wonders in the Suburbs and other films in the series, you can go online at fiaf.org for information and links. Uh, Wonders in the Suburbs is available through Monday night, so if you have yet to see it, don't delay. It's a wonderfully smart film, and uh, as you'll hear, I'm sure uh, Jeanne talk about it, you'll, you'll certainly don't want, won't want to miss it. For those who may not be familiar with Jeanne's work, uh, Jeanne is a César award-winning stage and screen actress who has always made bold choices in her career, taking on daring and delightful parts and bringing a singular voice to projects she, she takes on. She has worked with Jacques Rivette, Arnaud Depechin, Olivia Sayas, and Mathieu Amaric, to name a few. Uh, she recently finished shooting films with Xavier Giannoli and Thai director Api Chapong Vera Setakul. And Wonders in the Suburbs is her first, first film as a solo director. And if you've seen the film, uh, just like me, you probably are very glad that she decided to step, step behind the camera. And I hope that we will see many more films written and directed by her. Jan will be in conversation with Nicholas Elliott, a film critic and a programmer for the Locarno Film Festival, where Wonders in the Suburbs, as its world premiere uh, almost a year ago, August 2019. So it's kind of for coming back full circle. Uh, all of you uh, in the virtual audience are welcome to ask questions to Jeanne. You can use the Q&A box on Zoom and the comments section on Facebook. And Nicolas will transmit all your questions to, uh, to Jeanne. So without further ado, let's start. Thank you so much, Jeanne and Nicolas. Thank you, Delphine. And hello, Jeanne. Hello to hello, our virtual audience. Um, Jeanne, I'd, I'd like to start by talking to you about Montfermé. Montfermé, which is um, a municipality to the east of Paris and which has been the focus of quite a bit of cinematic attention in the last year because you made your film there and right around the same time, a local filmmaker, Lajli, wrote and directed the film Les Miserables, which then went on to be nominated for an Oscar and you play a small part in it. And I know that Laj helped you um, with being in Montfermé, but I wanted to ask you how your relationship with Montfermé started and how you became interested in filming there. Well, actually it started a long, long time ago because before, uh, it's very interesting because Laj Lee, who made Les Miserables was born in Montfermé and grew up there. But before him, there was another very significant film director who was born and made films there. And that's uh, Raba Amar Zaymesh, who made films like, I mean, Wesh Wesh is a film he made in the 90s in Montfermé. And then he went on to do other films. And I was um, acting in one of his films that he shot in Algeria. And so I've been knowing Montfermé as a cinema, as a place where cinema could live and could be significant for a long, long time now. And that's actually how my whole relationship to the place started. Because I had seen this movie, Wesh Wesh, in the 90s, and I had found it absolutely extraordinarily beautiful. And that's how I became interested in, in this place. And then one has to say that um, Montfermeil is close to another little 
city of the suburbs of Paris, which is called Clichy sous Bois. And that's where there, um, there was uh, something that is unfortunately very up to date at the moment. Two kids were shot, were killed by the police in 2005 in Clichy sous Bois. And there, and, uh, there has been a lot of riots uh, following this, this killing of those two kids who were 15. And um, so it's a place that is very emblematic of a lot of things in France, actually. Not only the, 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 the violence of the police, but also the livelihood, the richness of, um, of these suburbs of Paris, which are also a symbol of, of uh, what a nation like France that has a very heavy colonial history uh, does with, with its actual history and population. So in a way, I had all the reasons of the world to, to go there and be interested in telling stories that are happening there and filming there because they are very, they were both cinematographically very significant and also politically and socially. I don't know if I'm answering your question, actually, but... Uh, you're <laughs> totally answering my question. Um, there's an interesting thing that happens in, in Merveille à Montfermé, which is that your focus seems to be the political class, the, the team of the mayor, Emmanuel Joly, and the characters around her, but the people of Montfermé, the population, come to in a sense, really take care of themselves through the language school, through the fête de la brioche at the end, we see that these people are making the most of what might seem like some crazy initiatives on the part of the, the politicians. And so I'm curious about what led you to decide to focus on the political class as kind of the entry and then how you achieve this interesting balance? Well, I think what led me to, to have this interest on the political class is actually um, a matter of the narrative. Because I was uh, reading the newspapers in France and I was, I was reading the newspapers and I'm kind of interested in politics anyway. And I noticed, oh my God, this is really this is really super stuff for comedy because um, funnily enough, none of the decisions that are being made by these political people in the, in the, in this um, uh, community, I've, inv I've, I haven't invented anything at all. I haven't made anything at all out. It's, it's all things that really happened in, in reality. So I was, I was reading the newspapers and I was seeing that they, the politicians nowadays, they decide to, for instance, uh, do this, this day where everybody is gonna be dressed that way, as if this could be a solution for all the horrible social, historical, political problems of, of the populations of the suburbs. And I was reading that and I was thinking, oh my God, this is on the one hand, ludicrous and quite um, a, a matter of despair when you think you know this is no there's no way this is going to solve the problems of the people who live there but on the other hand everyone knows anything that creates despair can create comedy and is a very good drive for for writing a, a, a funny story so that was that was one thing but then um the other thing was that I'm very interested in, in changing the focus. Maybe this is because uh, cinema is what, this is something that cinema does to you because in, in films you can change the focus. And if you read a script, you will think, oh, okay, this is the lead character. But then when you see the film, you, you, you notice that maybe someone who is not at all the lead actor or not at all the, the, the main character in the story attracts the attention and and becomes the 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 person that you are that you are most related to 
And this was the kind of cinematographic experience that I wanted to make. And I thought this made sense because it was both a cinematographic and a political experience. That, okay, I had all these very well-known actors, very well-known French actors who was playing the, the characters of the, of the political um, uh, people in the place. But, but it, it was so easy to change the focus and to focus on all the non-professionals who are, were being part of the film as well. And this seemed to me to be, you know, I don't think films, they, well, maybe Agnès Varda did some cine tracts or, or there has been Godard films that are agit prop films. I don't know how, if you say that in English, agit prop or prop, propaganda films, or of course the, the, in, in Russia too, but, but this is not really my conception of films or I couldn't feel myself, feel that I myself can do that. But, but being in the, in the frame of, of doing really a, a cinematographical work, but, this, but that this came, could have a political significance, that, that was the, the experience that I was interested in making this film. It, it is, to me, a really amazing thing and a political thing about this film, about how it, it really is egalitarian. There is an egalitarian thing about it between, as you mentioned, famous professional actors, non-professional actors who I, I think you worked with in workshops um, in Montfermeil, but also between the different fictional characters. I mean, the, the core story of the film is a comedy of remarriage with your character of Joël getting back together with the character played by Ramzi Bedia, but you really, are willing to put them aside for long stretches of the film to have this kind of, it's not flat, but equal thing of mm. many different characters. And so another way that that manifests for me is that I find the film has a, a, a wonderful tone in the acting. There's something about the way the acting fits together, the way it's eccentric, it, as if it's spreading from one person to the other. And so, since you're an actress, I wanted to ask you how you went about composing the, the acting of this film, how you worked with your professional and non-professional actors to get to what to me is a, a very singular acting tone. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think eccentricity is actually the key word for that. Because eccentricity, if you if you go back to the to the the real um, how how do you call this the the um, etymology of the term, it's it's being outside the center or going away from the center, mm -hmm. and eccentricity is really what I am interested in. Uh, sometimes it can be not the good eccentricity it can be just oh fluffy fluffy uh, you know not conventional but n being non-conventional is not interesting in itself but if you if you manage to 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 really think about the actual real meaning of the term eccentricity it it just changes the 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 way you look at things and and you go from the center to somewhere else so this was the way I worked with actors. I tried to, 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 to see what was the center of the, of the typical narrative, like comedy of remarriage is, is a cliche in a way. It's something typical, but that was what I was interested in. You, you take something very archetypal in a way, and then you, you look while acting, while working on the acting, while working on where the camera looks, of, of going away from this center, from this, this, this thing that everyone knows, that everyone shares, and, and explore the possibilities of freedom that you have when you, when you, you, you do one step aside, when you, when you go a little bit away from the central direction that everyone knows and i think this is this is kind of a 
sort of um, general answer that I'm giving you, but it was also a principle, the principle of the work we did. So and when you, when you go away from, from, from what people would do if they are very centered, then you get to explore what, what comes to an actor when he is being unbalanced, when he is ex exercising his own freedom and when you give him space for that. And you also give the society, uh, that was my bet and that was my hope, the possibility of exploring what happens when, when, you, when, you, do, when you step aside mm -hmm. somehow. So you chose as a keyword eccentricity. I want to keep the keyword game going because you said freedom, which I know from reading interviews with you talking about what you look for in your own acting is so important. And from a very practical point of view, to achieve freedom for your actors, do you allow improvisation, for instance? How do you, how do you achieve what we see? I don't allow improvisation, actually. No, uh, I um, I don't allow improvisation that much because I'm kind of suspicious of words. And if you if you understand, improvisation very often means improvise, improvising new dialogues, and I'm not very fond of that because I think this, the script has already been done and the freedom you're looking for is not in looking for new words, other, other sentences and stuff like that. Uh, the way I'm working, I, I, I kind of look at them and that's the way I'm working with myself as well as an actress. And I always say, go, go. Your, your starting point must be the reality. But the reality of how you feel on that day when we are shooting scene one or two or three. And you know, the reality of the life of, a, of an actor or an actress is not what's in the script. It's, it's what happened last night. There's a, there's a beautiful song uh, uh, from, by Alain Souchon, I think, what, what happened last night. You know, what happened last night? I think it's the first thing you have to think about when you put a set on the, the foot on the set. Maybe last night you've been very, very happy. Maybe last night you broke up with your partner. Maybe last night your child cried for hours and you couldn't get some, any sleep until five o'clock in the morning and then you have to get up at six to get to the set. And, and the reality of your of your state of mind, of your feelings, of the state of your energy depends on what happened the night before. And I always say to the actors, this is your reality. And now just keep to this reality and we're gonna explore together what this reality means if you combine it with this script. And, and so maybe you're, you're supposed to be playing a, a scene where you are being very enthusiastic and very in love, for instance. But you, if you haven't slept at all the night before because your sh child has been crying, you're going to start this scene being very wary. And maybe this is the most beautiful thing of the world, you know, the wariness of happiness the wariness of enthusiasm. And it's far more interesting than the cliche of happiness or enthusiasm that you have in your head because everyone has it. And that's the way we work, like step by step. And maybe in the, in the, during that same day, the actor is gonna find his energy again, or her energy. And, at one point, this energy is going to burst out. And maybe this is going to be the moment where the character is supposed to be very wary because he's not getting anywhere. But then this energy will, pro will produce, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, a lot of fu fury or something like that. And, and this is the way I always work. Like, I want to know what the reality brings in the script and and what is the, the 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 slice of real life that an actor can produce and of course this is his freedom 
because it, it is a, a way of stepping aside from, from what has been established by the script. And to me, it has a, something like an existential value because our lives, whether you are an actor or not, are all made of that. You know, life has the society, the, the, your work, your family life, whatever, has produced a certain script. You are supposed to be married, you are supposed to be a bank employee, but then reality comes in and, and your freedom comes in. You're gonna choose to, um, to get along with this or that. And that's, that's when the, the freedom of an actor and the freedom of a human being gets to be seen, actually. Thank you. I see we have some questions from the audience now, so I'm going to start reading them. Um, I hope the members of our virtual audience will forgive me if I mangle their names in pronunciation. Um, we have a question from Sharon Beckus. The choice to be both the actress and the director would be very challenge what were your greatest rewards for making this choice i do not mean money i'm not sure i understand the question um the way i understand it is this viewer is saying it must be a challenge to be both in the film and to direct it and this viewer is interested in knowing what was most rewarding for you to have made the choice to do both uh huh. Uh, actually, I, I think it wasn't that rewarding while I was doing it. It's been rewarding since I've, I have been doing the film because I think um, this is maybe going to be a bit of a strange answer, but I belong to a generation where women thought they were a lot freer than they were. I mean, um, I have a feeling my generation of women, we, we, were, we thought we were fairly emancipated, but we realized that we weren't at all emancipated. And, and for instance, in my generation of actresses, we never thought it was a real possibility for us to be completely the center of a project. We always thought, okay, I'm an actress, I'm gonna go along with the director who was who who started to be to be to have also the possibility of being a woman in my generation more. There were more women directors, but but being an actress was basically obey or or get along with the with the world of someone else and i i realize now we we actresses of my generation they they make a lot of movies we we there are a lot of us who are making movies now also in america like and and there's also younger actresses they are they they find it very very much easier to think, okay, I can be, I want to tell stories. I don't necessarily have to be only the actress. So, so I think this, 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 um, this, this sense that I had the possibility of taking full responsibility for the stories I wanted to tell and not only through being an actress, it took me quite a while and also this experience to, to fully realize that. I think it's easier for, for younger actresses nowadays, fortunately. <laughs> okay, we have a question from Christopher Williams. The question is, as a director, how many takes do you prefer when filming for a given scene, knowing that although some actresses, such as Juliette Binoche, can keep her performance fresh into the sixth take, but others don't have the same stamina for retaining spontaneity. Uh -huh. Well, that depends. Um, the, the, this, this person was mentioning Juliette Binoche keeping her stamina into the sixth 
take. Yeah. I think Juliette uh, keeps her stamina in, in, uh, into, into the 60s. <laughs> <babe. laughs> um, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, the question of how many takes you make is a very interesting one because there, there are very, uh, a director like Philippe Garel, for instance, he does only one take. He says, okay, that's the one take, that's where you get the, the more, I'm sorry, there's an ambulance here. <laughs> yeah, there's the, 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 the more um, uh, richness of, of, um, of truths is, is in the first take and then no more. And I kind of agree with that. I think the first take is, has always something very special but I also love doing it over and over again, both as an actress and as, as a director, um, because something very, things very interesting happen when you, are, when you are fed up with doing this thing, you know? After 12, 13, 20 takes, you are so fed up that you let go in a very, very interesting manner. It's a little bit like when you're ill and you have to go to set and, and you're, you have 39 degrees of fever or things and, and you think, oh, I'm never gonna make that. And you just let go. And that's always where you, you do the best things. So, um, so my, I'm very, very lazy. So I would be very happy to do just one take, but I must confess, if you do a lot of takes, sing very, very inter interesting things come up. Now for my own film, we were very poor. We had a very low budget. So we had to shoot three scenes per day, which is enormous. Normally you shoot only one. And uh, one scene being a lot of take a lot of uh, shots but uh, so we we couldn't do that many many takes but my dream is to make another movie and have enough money to do only one scene a day and and do a lot of takes <laughs> we have a question from colleen geary oh sorry well i'll, I'll ask this question i'll go back i skipped someone but um, from Colleen Geary, the question is, do you think the shutdown and COVID experience leads to more creativity? Have you found time to dig deeper into yourself and learn more about yourself? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think it's for every person different, probably. As far as I am concerned, uh, the period where we were locked down, uh, I wasn't creative at all, but really not at all. I couldn't even read a book. Not only was I not creative, I could watch films. That's just about the maximum of what I could do. I wanted to read a lot. I wanted to play the piano a lot. I, I didn't do any of those two things. But what I, what I'm noticing, since we are, we are not locked down anymore, I am being very creative and I'm writing a lot and I'm shooting a lot and, and I'm, I have a lot of energy. So maybe I haven't been very creative while we were locked down, but, but there seems to be a movement of all these things that have accumulated that, that want to go out now and and I, I i'm shooting right now i was shooting today and i was noticing jesus christ i i, I have i have so much energy <laughs> right now and i'm yeah that would be my answer for myself we have a question from daniela e campos how do you prepare for a position in directing what type of preparation or strategies ahead of time during the filming process did there have to be? Hmm, how to prepare? Hmm, well, I guess um, we all prepare the same way, all directors in the world. There is so many very concrete, 
material things that you have to handle. Uh, it's just a, a period of madness where you go to solve one practical problem to the next. And I might be wrong, but I have a feeling it's exactly the same whether you are Steven Spielberg or Jean-Daniel Paulet or whoever. It's just going from one practical problem to the next, which is the real beauty of cinema, actually, because um, I remember there was this Marxist uh, way of putting things uh, when I was young, uh, theoretical practice. To me, cinema is really a theoretical practice because it's through the practice, through the practical things that you make decisions that actually have a theoretical uh, consequence or, or, or uh, or background, actually. But it's the, it's the joy of being an artist and not a, a philosopher, or a, it's that it's while you're deciding to put your, your camera here or there, or to choose this setup and not this other one, that you are making a, a philosophical statement, actually. And you don't really need to be conscious of that, but actually this is what I like in films uh, as, a, as a filmmaker, as an actress and also as a spectator because I have a feeling that this is what the spectators see actually. If you see a movie where technical problems have been solved only for the sake of solving technical problems, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not very interested in that kind of movies. But if, if I see a film and I, I, I understand, okay, they are looking at things this way because it has that kind of philosophical mysteries behind, then I'm interested in the film I'm watching. Thank you. Um, a question from Leila Metzitan. As an actress, may you tell us your process of your work for a movie shoot and for a play in the theater. Is it completely different or complementary? Thank you. Hmm. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's both. It's both completely different and complementary. <laughs> uh, maybe it's complementary because it's completely different. Well, uh, first thing I, I, I have a feeling um, being an actress in films, has, has much more to do with dancing as with being an actress on stage. I have a feeling cinema has very little to do with words, oddly enough, and, and much more to do with, with the body, with the way you move your body, because the body, you learn your lines where you, when you're shooting a movie you learn your lines only when you know where your movie is is going to be how your movie is going to dance with the camera with your partner how your body is going to do that and then you can you can say okay here i'm going to say i love you here i'm going to say i hate you but it's not it's the contrary of theater in a way because in theater you know okay i'm going to say i love you i'm going to say i hate you how am I doing that? It's the first thing that comes is, is the text. In, in films, the first thing that comes is, is the body. I don't know if I'm really answering this question, but somehow I think I am. <laughs> You're answering it for me in any case. I get it. Um, a question from Paula Kay. Can you name some of the directors who have had the greatest influence on you? Hola. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, uh, I guess uh, Laurence Ferreira Barbosa, uh, with whom I made a film in the 90s called J'ai horreur de l'amour, I hate love. Jacques Rivette, of course, uh, with whom um, I understood so many things. Uh, about freedom, precisely. Um, 
I, I might be I might be forgetting some of them. I'm sorry about that. But uh, Jean Claude Biet as well, who is a filmmaker who who with whom I made two movies. Uh, and lately, I was I, for me it was a shock to watch Apichat Pongwira Seta Cool the way he uh, I had never seen that. Actually, I think the the, the directors that, that really changed my my life are the ones where you go to set and and this is a complete new way of of setting the set. Uh, like with with uh, Apichat Pongwira Seta Cool, the way he uses the the um, uh, the extras that was amazing to me i've been making films for 30 years i had never seen anyone working like that with the extras in the shot and 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 having extras starting next to the main actresses uh, this this is a film where i was always acting with tilda swinton and tilda swinton and i we were preparing for the shot but he was concentrating on the extras and they, they were starting like in the middle of nowhere in the play, in the space. And, and, and for instance, that to me was, was, was like a revolution of my way of seeing how to make a movie. But I, I could say the same with Jacques Rivette, for instance, it, it was, it was kind of, I had never seen anyone working like that or, or yeah, I would, I would, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting some of them, but for now, let's concentrate on these four. <laughs> this is going to be the last question. Um, we have many great questions, but unfortunately we're running out of time. So I'm going to ask this question from Anthony Noriega. The question is, how do you feel about movies earlier in your, in your career and those filmed more recently? Do you feel more satisfaction on those earlier years or you see yourself as a single image woman actress and director in your generation? A single image woman? Yeah, I, I admit that I don't entirely understand that. Let me read that sentence again and see what we can make of it. Do you feel more satisfaction on those earlier years or do you see yourself as a single image woman actress and director in your generation? I, perhaps this gentleman means, do you see your work as something that is, uh, for lack of a more delicate word, monolithic, like one thing, you know, representing one thing? Or do you have a very different relationship to earlier parts of your career? I think that might be what he means. I hope I'm right, Mr. Noriega. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to answer this question because I, 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 uh, I don't understand myself actually. So I, I don't know. I have no image of, I have no image of myself as something that is being continuous in the, in the um, in in the 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 um, how do you call that um, l'épaisseur du temps? How would you translate that? The 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 density of time, the yeah. thickness of time. Yeah, the thickness of time. This this makes me think of of Marcel Proust, you know, uh, who says the the characters they they have. Um, they, they, they are emblematic, but, but at the same time, they, they have no relationship to, to one another, to, to themselves through the sickness of times. You are, you are someone so completely different. For instance, by Proust, by Proust, I'm sorry, I've been spending so much time in Germany. I sometimes I speak German instead of English. Uh, in, in Proust's novels, uh, uh, he he says that you're not the same person considering who who you are in love with. You know the person who is in love with this person is not the same person who is in love with this other person. There's there's no unity of the of the of the self, uh, and that's very much the way I see myself. You're you're making me think, Jean, of something I read you said recently, which I thought was so beautiful. Um, you recently got the Legion of Honor 
and you were asked by some journalist, how can you accept this because you're very critical of the current government in France? And you replied that it was a way of honoring the legions of people that exist within you. I'm paraphrasing you, but I just thought that that was such a beautiful answer. Um, and you just made me think of it. So I thought I would mention it. Um, and I think we've come to the end of our discussion time. So I just wanted to thank you, Jeanne, for this great discussion. And, and thank you to FIA for allowing us to have it. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeanne and Nicolas. It was such a thoughtful discussion. discussion. Thank you again. Uh, I know it's late in France, Jeanne, so thank you to the both of you and thank you for joining in. We had quite a lot of comments and questions and they were all, all very thoughtful, so I hope we'll save them in one way or another and send them to you, Jeanne, because they were really wonderful comments. People are really commending you for your work uh, on behalf of culture uh, in this past few months, on behalf of all the people in France who have been kind of fighting uh, uh, to, to keep a way of life and have better lives, essentially. So I wanted to, to tell you about this. Uh, and thank you for joining us. You can see Jeanne's film through Monday night. So don't forget to go to FIAS website to get all the information to watch the film. It's, really, uh, it's a really smart, uh, quirky and brilliant film. So you don't want to miss that. It's probably not gonna come back in the US. So it's you one shot at watching it. And if you are able to support FIAF, we would really appreciate it. It's been difficult, like uh, all organizations, cultural organizations across the world, we've been struggling. We don't even know when we can reopen our doors. So if you're able to donate and support FIAF, you can do that on our website as well, fiaf.org. So thank you very much to all of you. And hopefully to see you soon, Jen, in person maybe. Yes, <laughs> yes. that would be great. Yeah. Thank you, thanks, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'on fait maintenant On est toujours tous ensemble. Ah. Ben, maintenant, on va sur l'autre.